I define culture as as a, a set of shared interpretations and and norms. When that happens, you can change anything. Where things cannot be other than they are. People won't change their ways overnight, but when they do, the consequences are profound and durable. There is no way in the world that in business that I would ever agree to the notion that hard skills are more important than soft skills. That's just false. It is remarkable how fast cultures can change. You need to reject the existing model to get any of the benefits. Don't use my method in that part of the world. Don't do it. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Agile Insights Conversation. Again, we're uh, joined by Roger Martin uh, th for the third time. I was not expecting this when he agreed to do the very first interview with me. Thank you for that, Roger. It's a pleasure pleasure to host you. Um, before I give the word to Roger um, uh, for a few, few moments, for those of you who haven't heard about Roger, who haven't seen our previous interviews, just a very, very quick introduction. Roger is a professor of strategic management emeritus at the University of Toronto's Rotman School of Management, where he also served as dean for 15 years, 1998 to 2013. And in today's conversation, we will actually talk a bit about the time that he spent there and the work that he did there. In 2017, he was, think, uh, he was ranked number one on the Thinkers 50 list ever since. And before that, he was always in the top five, I think. But that particular year, he was number one. He has published a ton of books. I think in total, it's around 12. And some of those books you can see in the background, one of them, When More Is Not Better, we had an interview on that. Another one, A New Way to Think. This is going to be the focus of today's conversation, but also some like management classics, such as Playing to Win, which he wrote with the former CEO of Procter & Gamble. And based on the work that he did at the Rotman School of Management, his books that he's written, obviously, Roger is a trusted advisor to many CEOs around the world. And um, he's an alum of Harvard Business School and a ton of other things that he had done. And maybe some of those we will unpack in today's conversation. So, Roger, a very, very warm welcome to you. And thank you for being here. Uh, hey, it's my pleasure, Sir Rob. There are, there, are, there are very sort of few people who I, I always say at the end, hey, have me back anytime because the conversations are so uh, helpful, useful and pleasant and you're one of them, so I'm happy to be back for a, for a third time, and I hope it's not the last. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm not sure how many of those few people actually take you up on that offer, but I always do. So yeah. <laughs> if yes, you yes, extend an offer to me, yeah. I'm happily going to take that. Perfect. So as mentioned, today's conversation will be about this book. It came out, when was that, Roger? Was it in May, June of May. this year, something May. around that? May of, May, May of this, of this year. year. So May 2022, if you're watching this sometime in the future. And this book is a bit unusual compared to the other books that you've written. Can you walk us through what makes this book like stand out, not in terms of whether it's better or not, but in terms of the format compared to the other books that you've written? Sure. The, yeah. The, the format of this one is is 14 chapters that are largely freestanding, uh, right? So in all the rest of my books, I would argue that unless you started from the start and read through to the end, you would get sort of lost and confused. Like, why is he talking about this? Like if you started at the back of playing to win or the back of the opposable mind, uh, you'd be confused. Here, they're all on a theme, right? Uh, new management uh, models, but each chapter can be consumed on its own. You can say, oh, I'm thinking about uh, capital allocation now. Oh, there's a chapter on that. I'll just dive in on that and it'll be freestanding and uh, and allow you to tackle that, that uh, subject. Or, oh, gee, I'm wondering about uh, how to use uh, analytics. There's a, there's a chapter on, on that. So it was a break from the past uh, uh, for me, but I, I've, the reaction has been has been good, and uh, and people people seem to like it. I, I'd like it to be a bit of a manual that's on as as with your bookshelf there that can be back on your bookshelf, and and you when you've got some management challenge or or problem, you can pull it out and say, Hey, is there a chapter on that? Oh, there is. Let me read that, and maybe that'll help me. 
Yeah. And a bit of the history, if I understood it correctly, based on the part of the, the, the thing that you cover in the introduction is, this is also based on a ton of papers that you've written over the years for Harvard Business Review with your editor there. And yes. basically, you came to the conclusion that taking these articles and maybe updating some of them, but then putting them together in some kind of comprehensive format could be that management manual, correct? That is that is exactly right, and and in fact, I give great credit to my editorial partner there. I've now done, I think, with the I've got a new one coming out in in uh, November December issue. I think that'll be at the twenty first HBR article with with uh, David Champion. That'll be thirty first overall, but the last twenty plus with this uh, terrific uh, terrific. Uh, uh, thinker, uh, and I know you spent the summer in France. He hangs out in France all the time. He lives not far from the campus of INSEAD. So even though he's at HBR and he's a Brit, uh, he lives in uh, France. <laughs> yeah, so INSEAD was a bit further away, far away from where I was. Otherwise, I would have said, next year, I'm going to meet up with David. But maybe that's oh, going to happen should. anyway. You should. Maybe, you yeah, maybe I should. Maybe I should. I like so there are some other interviews that you already had about this book. Um, as preparation of today's interview, I watched several of them. And the one that I particularly liked was the one with Tiffany Bova. And oh, yes. Tiffany made an exceptional job connecting this book to the other books that you've written as part of them playing to win um, and uh, when more is not better. And I think for everyone, if you haven't read those books or if you have read those books either, it's great to watch that interview and we will definitely link it in our notes. So my intention today is to not repeat what Tiffany has already done in a very great way because I don't see any value in that. It's out there mm -hmm. on YouTube. Everyone can watch it. I want to focus today's conversation on two topics. One is the context for writing this book. And you already shared a bit about that, but I want to dive in uh, topic wise. And the second is to talk about one out of those 14 chapters, because we're not going to cover all 14 of them. And that would be a bit of a spoiler with regards to reading this book. But I want to focus today's conversation on the topic of culture. Um, and the, that resonated with me for several reasons. One is I get called from my clients, including up to CEO level. Hey, we need support on this because we need to make a cultural transformation. And the other is, I do see cultural challenges in my own organization as well as we grow. And when I read that chapter, I found a lot of interesting insights and different perspectives to what I have read otherwise and what I have practiced myself. I think there's a lot of things that can be connected, but there were some genuinely new things in there which I want to explore with you, both for the benefit of our audience, but also for my own benefit as someone who, who works in, in that space. So. Let me start with the context. And I have a ton of notes here in the book, and I will go through some of them. In some cases, I will even read out a few sentences out of that book. The first sentence that caught my eye was the following one. It has become clear to me over the years that in nearly every case, the poor results weren't down to their not working diligently enough in pursuit of their goals. It was because the model that guided their action wasn't up to the task. And you're talking about organizations and individual leaders and teams not achieving a certain outcome that they've set out as a goal for themselves, but instead of reevaluating the assumptions behind their strategy, behind their tactics, which in many cases is based on a certain model, conscious or unconscious, that they were taught at some point, so they didn't like uh, think about that or question that. In most cases, they just tried to do the previous model in a more diligent way. And the reason that struck with me was that when I get called by organizations, they want to become more agile, especially in their product development, you see that over the past decades, they try to become more and more perfect in the waterfall development model without ever questioning whether that model in itself makes sense. So what I would be interested in, Roger, is whether you can share with us out of your decades long work with organizations, with leaders, CEOs particularly, where you saw people basically falling into that trap of 
having a model in their mind, maybe not even consciously, but constantly following that model without ever questioning it. And when you came about and said, not, not to show you as a hero, but like as the challenger and saying, hey, maybe we need to start with the model and not with the execution on how to perfect an already flawed model. So, yeah. No, happy, happy to talk about that. But, but I, I would just say the, the example you gave, like your whole, the whole body of work that you're involved in is, is exactly that, right? Is if you say, God, we just didn't put enough energy into waterfall. We didn't make the stage gates kind of, you know, kind of high enough and tight enough and didn't have the, the have the, the timing of everything, right? If we could only just get that more firmly ensconced, everything would be fine. And, 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 you know, your whole approach is, um, nope, it just, that's, that's never going to get you, uh, uh, there. So I, 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 I actually think agile scrum is a, is a, a perfect example of you need to reject the model to get the, the existing model to get any of the benefits uh, uh, of, of them. But I, I mean, I guess I would use the example often. So often I work with big with big companies and they are not most big companies. There are hardly any big companies that are only in like one business. And so they they typically are in in multiple uh, businesses, the your average modern modern corporation. And and they they kind of often sort of are frustrated about about the degree to which um, it's so hard to control and coordinate this big organization and the capital markets don't really appreciate all their work in controlling and coordinating these organizations. And in fact, their own people don't seem to appreciate the, the, all the work and energy that goes into controlling and, and, and coordinating. And, and so their inclination is we've got to just make sure let's let's have the budgeting tighter and the and the processes for really controlling them a uh, kind of uh, uh tighter and and all that happens is the capital markets are like you know god uh, you're, you're a big sprawling uh, kind of empire i'm not sure what value you're adding etc and if it's like you know johnson and johnson or toshiba or general electric or whatever they force them to be broken up um and so so the idea that we're not controlling and coordinating rigorously enough is just the wrong model, right? And what I what I argue with with them is, no, 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 no. If you have if you have a broad diversified company um, that's in a lot of product areas, let's say you're you know you're Coca Cola, and and yes, you make colas and you're famous for it, but you also make. Uh, bottled water and you make orange juice and you make sports drinks, etc. People don't come to the big fridge in the, in the uh, uh, C store and say, am I going to buy Dasani by Coca-Cola or Aquafina by PepsiCo? In fact, most of them don't even know that, that, that those are the companies be behind them. They're just deciding whether they want a Dasani or an Aquafina. And so if you're Coca-Cola, your job is not to control and coordinate Dasani. Your job is to figure out how you can make Dasani, help make Dasani more successful in at that coal phase where Saurabh's at the, mm -hmm. at, at the fridge to de deciding which, which to buy, that you'll, you'll, your hand will go to Dasani, you're not to, uh, uh, to Aquafina, or you're, you're, you'll go to uh, Powerade, not, uh, uh, not, uh, not Gatorade. Um, and, and so if instead you say, my job is not to control and coordinate, my job is to help, right? Then you focus on making your businesses more competitive, and if they're more competitive, right, they'll be happy about being part of the, the company. The capital markets will say, wow, isn't this an effective uh, uh, organization? They seem to be able to make Dasani better. They seem to be able to make Minute Maid better. They seem to be making Power better. They seem to be making all of these things uh, uh, better. You know, what's, uh, what's not to like about that? But it it required switching from our job is to control and to coordinate to our job is to help, to genuinely help. Yeah. And there is actually, so when we talk about culture later, it's part of this conversation. This is one of the questions you added to 
the the work that you did as a dean when you were talking to faculty members. And I'll, I'll bring that up later. So we're going to park this sure, for sure. now, but it's a recurring theme. And you also, as, as you brought up now this example of Coca-Cola, which is a consumer goods company, et cetera. So one of the models, and we're not going to deep dive into that today, but I, I it just like came up in my mind is in terms of customers, there's always been this focus on customer loyalty. Yep. Right, including like measuring NPS, net promoter score from Fred. I was a, I'm a Bain, a Bain and Company alum, so I'm very, fairly familiar with that. But then you suddenly yeah, bring like up this Fred, concept. Fred, Fred like, yeah. And then you bring up this concept and say, so in terms of, if you look at neuroscience, customer loyalty, probably not the right thing to do, but like thinking about customer habits, yes. right? And building that habit that they choose your product and then not interfering with that habit any longer. That's probably like a better strategy. Now, there are like in each of these chapters, you take one or I think sometimes even two existing models, which have become state of the art to some extent without people, without enough people questioning. It's not like no one's questioning them, but then you present an alternative model based on your experience. What I see in many cases, again, going back to my work, there is if you provide an alternative to the status quo, in many cases, people are like, okay, prove us that this is going to work up front. And for that, I have another quote from your book. It's still part of the introduction. There's so many like little golden nuggets in there. And I'm gonna read this. So American pragmatist philosopher, Charles Sanders Peirce observation that no idea in the history of the world has been proven in advance analytically, which means that if you insist on rigorous proofs of proof of the metrics of an idea during its development, you will kill it if it is truly a breakthrough idea because there will be no proof of its breakthrough characteristics in advance. And then you talk about a bit the context here. And basically, you're stating that if you take the existing model and based on that existing model, we have an existing, for example, data set. But then you try to prove something that's going to happen in the future, which anyway can't be done. But if you take that type of data, that type of thinking, that type of context, you will probably don't believe that this new thing, this new way to think would be better than the status quo that already exists. Did I get that right? You did. You did. And, and, and this is one, you know, there's, there's the expression possession is nine tenths of the law. You know, that's why in the world that applies to ideas too. Uh, and, and you've described why, uh, possession is nine tenths of the law when it comes to ideas, right? It's like, well, this is the way we've always done it. Everybody else does it this way. Therefore we'll do it, uh, that way, that way too. And, if it's not working out the way we thought, it must be because we're not doing it hard enough, yeah. intensively enough, et cetera. Um, and so, you know, uh, it, I mean, it's, it's sad. And I, and part of the book uh, reason for writing the book is that's just sad to, uh, to watch, um, because, because people are working hard in ways that is not going to get them the conclusion that they want just full stop. It is not going to get them the conclusion yeah. that, the, that they want. And, and I, you know, I, I'd, I'd wish for them a better, a kind of a better, a better fate than that. Yeah. I mean, they're wasting their lifetime and their life energy to work, work in a wrong way. Now, what, 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 what I, and, and I've been like thinking about this for many years and your book again, triggered some of the thoughts that I had in my head and, when I look at the waterfall approach, I mean, mm -hmm. this goes back to a paper that was written in 1969, 1970. So first of all, since then, computers and technology have evolved, right? My dad in 1970, he was 16 years old. A, a few years later, he was at one of the top engineering schools in Iran and he was doing programming. But the programming that he was doing was not on a PC. It was like one of those big machines where you had to like punch, you had punch cards, right? Yeah. And I, that's how during I started. The, I, I, that's I, how you I, started, right? I, no, I, I can remember I grew that. Up near, near University of Waterloo, and University of Waterloo yeah. had Canada's first installation of an IBM 360. 
Uh, uh, that, that was, and it did outreach to all the high schools in the area so that if you created a high school uh, computer science uh, course, uh, and in my school, it was a grade 11 computer science course, they would give you free timeshare. And so I went to the, in, in the early 70s, I went uh, uh, down to the, to, the, uh, to the giant room uh, that they housed the 360, punched out my punch cards and took my huge stack of punch cards and, and put them into the compiler. Uh, so I, I know that era. Uh, that yeah, era extremely yeah, well. Yeah, it was a breakthrough. Yeah, no, uh, and it was an absolute yeah. breakthrough when they would, when the computer would let you know on what card your error uh, occurred. So you had, like, say, five hundred cards, and, and you'd go through and say error, and they, you know, they'd say, you know, kind of uh, yeah, subroutine error or something, and and you had no idea, and then and then. A year later, so there was this incredible breakthrough where where they would say, uh, you know, essentially your program failed on card two ninety seven. So you could at least have some some <laughs> idea. So, so I was in the I was in the Neanderthal era of uh, of computing. Yeah. Now you mentioned something mm -hmm. which probably some of our audience didn't didn't really pay attention. You mentioned the concept of timeshare. Yes. Right. So you, you had a specific time dedicated to you. Why? Because not everyone could own one of those big machines and yes. work with them 24-7. That, that was just not possible. So in that context, again, it goes back to the context, it might make sense to spend a lot of time on requirements, spend a lot of time on in analysis, spend a lot of time on like developing it. And then you have that one hour time, one hour slot where you go with your 500 cards, put them in, and then you get your result, right? That's when you do your test. Yeah, I remember now, it well. 50 years, yeah, 50 years later, everyone has not only one computer, they can have access to 10 computers, right? That's not the limiting resource. So would it make sense to change the way we think about like programming, et cetera? That's one thing. The other thing is, and that's where I want to get your thoughts on as well. If you read that paper from Winston Royce, who was an IBM consultant, he writes right after below the drawing, he writes, this approach invites risk and failure. And then he goes another 10 pages about how the approach should actually look like which looks then quite similar to what an agile approach would like would look like today. But whoever I speak to, they only saw that picture. They didn't uh, even read what was right below the picture. Oh, interesting. Now, my, question to you, right? yeah. now my question to you, you talk about 14 different models where you no. come up with improvements or a different model. Have you seen the same happening in your sphere of work where people just take a simplification of a model, don't read what it's all about, within which type of contexts that model applies, but then still take it as, okay, that's the one way to go. That's like a best practice, which we hear a lot of consultants talk about. Yeah, well, uh, a good example of it, uh, and, and I talk about it in one of the chapters of the book, essentially is Aristotle. So Aristotle, is the father of science. He is the first human being, essentially, who said, <clears throat> we need to have a rigorous methodology for determining the cause of an effect we see, right? He, that's what he wanted to understand. He said, well, why does this happen? What is the cause of the effect? And he said, well, what you'd have to do is do this sort of experimentation uh, to be able to then, to de then declare this causes uh, that. That's the origin of science, fourth century uh, uh, BC, and the world has adopted uh, scientific uh, scientific methods, and it was advanced dramatically in the scientific revolution by Bacon, Descartes, and Galileo and Newton. Um, but it's all Aristotelian, uh, actually, at it, at its heart. But they didn't listen to Aristotle, who said this method is for only part of the world. Uh, yes. What part was he meaning? He said, well, this method is for the part of the world where, and I love the way he described it, where things cannot be other than they are. 
right? And I always use as an example, see this pen, right? If I let go of it, what happens? It falls. Did it fall last week? Yes. Is it going to fall next week? Yes. Is it going to fall in Iran? Yes. Is it going to fall in Fort Lauderdale? Yes. Is it going to fall in Antarctica? Yes. It's because it's part of the world where things cannot be other than they are. There is this universal force of gravity. It doesn't change from week to week, year to year, uh, century to century, place to place. It just is. And so he said, use my scientific method for that, right? And the world said, hooray, we're going to do that. Uh, and then they ignored what he said. He said, um, um, by the way, there's another part of the world. It's the part of the world where things can be other than they are. What did he mean by that? The example I always use is this, right? Uh, in 1999, there were exactly zero of these on the planet, smartphones, uh, now in 2022, or last time I checked, there were 4.4 billion of them. That's a part of the, and now, right? Notice it was within arm's length, like it's within arm's length of everybody because you get the hives or the cold chills. If it's, if it's farther away, we've changed our lives completely around this thing. So that's the part of the world where things can be other than they are. And interesting enough, it's the kind of the part of the world where people interact because people learn things and do things differently. And what did Aristotle say? The father of science who we're listening to and making everything scientific. Don't use my method in that part of the world. Not, oh, be careful. Yeah. It's not quite as powerful. You have to modify it. Don't. Don't do <laughs> it. And, what, and, and the world has utterly, completely, and absolutely ignored that and is now applying science to kind of everything uh, under, the, under the sun. Um, and... Uh, I mean, it'll be unpopular of me to say, but I will anyway. I mean, you know, Tony Fauci just uh, uh, stepped down today, right? And he was, uh, I mean, what he said is all the decisions we made were based on science for the novel coronavirus, a new thing that we'd never seen before. Yeah. What Aristotle what say? That's that's how you're made. That's how you're supposed to make uh, uh, your decisions. No, the father of science would have said, "You're crazy. You're 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 crazy. You're 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 saying you're applying science to something that we don't know anything about and that is ever changing, and we don't know the interactions of of people and any of that. And you're saying it's science." No, no. You, you, bring, uh, you bring up a very important point because science in itself, there are differences, right? So there is mathematical science where you can get to a truth, right? I still remember in high school writing below the equation like QED, right? Quad error demonstrantum. That's what, that's then a proof. Then there is natural science and you bring up this example of Newton's law of gravity, etc which we believed was the absolute truth. But a few hundred years later, Einstein showed us that it's the truth within a certain context. Yeah. And if you it's broaden that context, if you true. move away, yeah, exactly. If you move away from Earth and probably move, go to the moon, gravity will change. It's still there. It's a, it's a, it's a force, but it's, it's not as strong. Right. And we now know the under, we understand like based on what the force is created, but still, Within different contexts, different things apply. Now, we get from math to natural science, where you still have some predictability, and you go to social science. And the problem that I see right, in social science, be it psychology, be it economists, be it, they treat... Epidemiologists. That type of, yeah. yeah. They treat that type of science the same way as, so, as ma natural science or, or, or math even, Right. And I think that's not something that we can do. We can see patterns, and based on patterns, you can see some kind of repetition. But we need to be aware, even if some of these things are called like law of whatever, they're not really natural laws, right? And they, exactly. they do have some variation, which we don't see in, in these kind of devices, because here we're applying a ton of natural laws, and that's why we have the predictability. Yeah. Now... You talked about Aristotle. In your book, you also talk about someone else, which is Karl Popper. Hmm. And you say you're, you're a friend of his school of falsificationism. 
Yeah. And I'm not sure this might be like a quick, a short segue here or, or side conversation. Have you ever read his essay about clouds and clocks? Yes, yes. Yes, right? And that's exactly the point where he says, okay, there are things that are like clocks. They are very predictable. We talk yeah. about like clock, like clock yeah. pre pre precision, but then there are things like clouds. I mean, sometimes we can't even predict what the weather in two hours is going to be because it's so unpredictable. And yeah. what we need to understand yeah. is to treat things as they are because, and then treat them differently. Yes. So apply different models in different contexts. Yeah. No, I, 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 I couldn't agree more. And, and, I, and I guess I, I think Popper's one of the world's great, uh, uh, great geniuses. Um, and, and, and everything you're saying, too, like my most beloved academic mentor was a fellow named Chris Argerus, uh, the father of organizational uh, learning. And what he really kind of you know, pounded gently but pounded into my head is 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 this idea that there is there is variance he would always say that roger there is variance and and, and that's what you're you're saying which is which is there's clock like things and there's cloud like things there's variance they're different and you have to think about them uh, uh differently and and uh yeah i think i think one of the great dangers to the world actually is the the application of of what people think of as science. They don't really actually even understand what science is. The, the application yeah. of science, uh, like, you know, like essentially, right, the, uh, what most people who profess to be scientific uh, think science is about is, is proof and demonstrating the truth. Uh, whereas actually the value of science to the world is the pursuit of better understanding is proven. Yeah, yeah, uh, and and it's 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 actually a process, and that's what Karl Popper would would uh, uh, would say, which is which is what we have to do is is uh, kind of uh, choose the theory that is that uh, is uh, most tested and found least wanting, right? And that's as good as you're ever going to get. Uh, and Newtonian physics is a perfect example. Here's a certifiable, you know, global historical genius. Uh, and we said he's, he, it's the truth. And the answer is it's kind of sort of nearly the truth, but not exactly. And it took a, you know, a patent clerk who didn't like to wear shoes to come along and, and say, mm, it's not quite entirely true in all situations and we just got to yeah. get more that way like i wish I, I i there's a there's a bunch of modern things that i really hate sorab and one thing i hate is the idea that fact checking can declare whether something is true or false yeah i it, I, I find it a I find it appalling. I read these. I read these fact checking, and they're just another opinion, right? It's like, well, we cho chose this data as what represents the truth, and so we're going to declare that statement is either true or 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 false. Are you kidding me? You call yourself scientific when you're doing that, right? Yeah. I, it's, 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 I mean, it's wrecking the world, right? It's, it's this, this obsession with the truth and declaring the truth in matters of human endeavors is creating the div divisiveness in the world now, right? If we could instead say we're on a journey to try and figure out more stuff and get smarter over time, we would we would be working more together than being being at loggerheads on on everything and that's all and that's all goes right back to not listening to aristotle yeah and so you bring this up with um things being as they are mm -hmm. and things that basically are not as they are, like they, they can be changed. So change, yeah. Newton and Einstein both looked scientifically as things as they are, and still we needed to make an adaptation. Yes. 
But if you think about the other category of things, when we apply truth or science to them, I mean, there are so many examples where we see organizations having done the adaptation because they, they realized that our, their initial thinking, I mean, you, you, hold, you held up an Apple iPhone, right? Initially, there was no App Store because Steve Jobs didn't want an App Store. Yeah. And then he said, oh, it would actually be a good idea to have an App Store because some other people convinced him, right? Yeah. And this is, this is the point where we constantly need to challenge our mental model, our thinking model, the assumptions that we have based on that and how we, how we come to decisions. Now, as we've covered the context, right? And this is something, if I remember the book correctly, this goes through the whole book, right? Challenging the models and then coming up with new ones. And I mentioned initially, I want to talk or focus today's conversation on the topic of culture, because there are so many different ways to look what, at organizational culture, what it is, and even more ways <laughs> to look at how it can be changed. And I want to explore today with you what has worked for you, both in your work as a leader, as the Dean of Rotman School of Management, but also in the work that you've done as an advisor to several CEOs and organizations as part of that. But let's start with the definition of culture. How do you define culture, Roger? So I define culture as, as a set of shared interpretations and, and norms, right? So, so you know you have a strong culture. No, I'm not saying good culture or bad culture. If, if you could put like, uh, like uh, uh, having, having people behind glass watching, watching a meeting, and let's say it's a boss chewing out his, uh, his subordinate for doing a, a crummy job on something. And if you have 20 people behind uh, one-way mirrors from the organization watching that and then writing down what really happened there, right? And if they all write down, oh my God, uh, that that was that that subordinate made a grievous error, uh, and he's uh, uh, he's kind of been told he's on the way uh, out. He may be able to save himself, but probably not. And if you went around everybody's sheets, they all said the same thing. Then you'd know you have a strong culture because they're all sort of watching, and they say, "Oh, I know what that means." When he said those words. He meant you're on the last legs and and one more and you're and you're out of here. Even though even though you know he may have, may have used all sorts of codes, everybody understands it. If instead you had those same twenty people and they all had a different different interpretation of of of, uh, of that, the, those twenty pieces of paper would have some, maybe some similarities but great differences because then. What you don't have is everybody having a, a way of making sense of what's going uh, on and what interactions actually actually mean. Um, and so, so, so you can have a weak culture where you know anything can anything can uh, can happen, or a strong culture. Then, now the strong culture can be one that you would like, right? Let's say, let's say the, the boss, rather than chewing out the person, the boss was saying, you know, this wasn't up to scratch, uh, but I, I trust you. I have a faith, a faith in you. Here's what we're going to do to try and make sure that, uh, that uh, this doesn't happen the next time. You know, kind of, are we good? Are, are you feeling comfortable and confident? And everybody else says, okay, that was, that was our usual kind of, uh, kind of, kind of tough tough love kind of training training session and they're they're both they're both going to work on it and you can be optimistic about it then you'd have you'd have probably a product what most people would call a productive uh culture where there's a desire to see people succeed and there's good kind of uh kind of interactions uh, uh between the t between the uh the two or on a subject that I know is near and dear to your heart too is on innovation, right? If, if instead the meeting was of somebody coming forward with an with an idea, and the the the, the superior in, in in of the two says, you know, well, we're not going to do that. My ass is on the line, and you haven't given me enough uh, proof, and I'm not going to I'm not going to sacrifice my job for your idea, right? 
and everybody writes, oh, that's the usual ass covering of the senior senior person who's never going to do anything uh, uh, bold because that's the way it is around here. Then you'd have another you'd have another bad culture, but it's a culture because everybody understands that that's the way things work around here. Yeah. And you have a, a few few quotes in your in, in that section of the book, and I think some of them are from Edgar Schein, right? Culture is how we do things around here. Um, yes. What I should do in this situation, or yeah. who must I pay attention to? So yeah. it goes a lot into basically the behaviors that people demonstrate based on certain things. And what I always explain is our behaviors, and this goes back to neuroscience, are largely driven, and we talked about this briefly about customers, by our habits. Yeah. So the collective habits translate into the organization's culture. Yeah. And as we all know, changing habits is on an individual basis already difficult, let alone on a collective basis. So by that, changing culture is not impossible, but it's very difficult. Yeah. And one thing that you write here, I found it interesting, and I want to get your thoughts on this. CEOs recognize that changing strategic direction in any significant way will inevitably involve some cultural change. And you can only change culture by altering how individuals work with each other. And then you come up with a framework that can be applied. We'll go into that later. But walk me through that thought that any type of strategic shift, right, in most cases involves a change to the organ or requires a change to the organization's culture. Because I see that happen a lot. They're just, we want a new strategy. But they're not thinking about, oh, man, this is going to involve a big cultural change, and that's going to be difficult. Right, right. No, and it often uh, often prevents that change from happening. For, for, for me, the, the, the reason is that it all comes down to choice, right? So strategy, you're... Every, every organization has a strategy now. Some companies say, oh, we don't have a strategy. We need to. No, your strategy is what you do. They do have one. <laughs> yeah, they, do, they, they do have one. It's, it's, the, it's the summation of all the choices that have gotten them to the position they're currently in. So if you're going to make a strategy change, what that means is changing the choices that you, that you make. Right. And who knows what way that's that's going to be. Let's say, uh, you know, we're going to choose to uh, treat customers in this new and different way than we they, we used to. Or we're going to choose to get into this new business that we haven't been into in before or this new geography. What it all is, is a change um, in your choices. And for a change in choices to manifest itself, to actually happen. It just means that people will have to do different things than they did before, right? And for them to do different things than they did before, they have to feel comfortable that those things are the things that they they should be doing, they feel good about uh, uh, doing, et cetera. And, and that typically kind of requires them to, to say, I'm going to work in a different way, interact with people in the organization in a different way. And to me, that means culture, right? That means there has to be, if you will, a new normal, right? You have to get to a stage where, where we used to do it this way, so that meant, that meant when I was launching this new product, this is how we launched it, and this is how I interacted with the sales forces. How I interacted. Now we're doing it this other way. And at first, that's not going to be comfortable, uh, and it's not going to be ingrained, and people are going to have less of a sense of how are we supposed to do that, right? Because that's culture. How are we supposed to do that? Uh, and so you've got to help people get to that point where doing that new thing, that different way is, is understood by all to be the right thing uh, to do, the sensible thing to do. They're doing their job properly. Mm -hmm. Now, you bring this up. So we understand changing strategy usually involves making different choices. Making different choices results in different behaviors, which is then again a different culture. Now, 
in how to change that culture, you bring up three things. And I've prepared a short, small flip chart here. Hey, right? excellent. Oh, yeah, yeah, I just copied it from the book, <laughs> a bit bigger. Yeah. Now, you talk about these are steering mechanisms to change an organization's culture. There are three things, the formal mechanisms that we have, the interpersonal, and the cultural. And as formal, you say, structure, systems, processes, etc. People can, can read themselves, basically. Uh, and then how they connect to each other. So the formal ones go to the in, have impact on the interpersonal, interpersonal on the, on the cultural. Again, culture has on the interpersonal and the interpersonal has on the formal. But you didn't show anything that goes directly between this one here and this one at the bottom. And I would love you to walk us through this. Basically, what are these three different um, steering mechanisms that we have? And give us some examples on on each of these steering mechanisms and how they are connected to each other. Maybe using one of the cases that you have in your book, but also whatever other case you feel free to use. Sure, sure. Well, let, let, let's start at the top of, uh, of the diagram, formal mechanisms. So a formal mechanism is a, a, uh, a reporting relationship. You, so Rob, you report to that, uh, that person. Another formal mechanism is compensation. Uh, here's, here's how we're going to compensate you. If you make your budget, you'll get a 15% uh, a bonus. Those are, those are formal mechanisms. They're formal in the sense that they're kind of, you can write them down and, and, and you say that's, uh, that's the structure. There'll be an organization chart. There'll be a compensation, uh, system. Those are formal, uh, mechanisms. And what people often do to try and change culture is to change those, right? They say, well, we need to have a more entrepreneurial culture. So we're going to flatten the organization or we're going to give more incentive compensation. And that's going to change our, our, our culture. But unfortunately, there's this thing, you know, that's going to change the, the, the shared norms and interpretations, which is, which is culture, right? And, and what I mean by that is like, you'll have a culture if, if uh, you're a brand new marketing person and you come on and, and, and the senior marketing people say, Rob, you got to watch out for the salespeople, right? They never want to sell what we want them to sell. They want to sell the easiest thing to sell, right? And so... Anytime you're talking to them, you should expect them to be trying to say, no, 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 make it easier, make it easier, make it easier or not. They don't care about anything, right? And if you're told that the, the moment you walked in, uh, because that's the way everybody in marketing thinks about the people in sales, the culture will be, uh, will be that, that shared understanding. And meanwhile, the salespeople are saying, oh, those jerks at, at marketing, they never care about the customer. They care about all their great, great thoughts and ideas that, that don't really work with the customer. And so that's the culture. So you can't make any formal change, right? You can say, ah, ah, you know, here's what I've got to do. I've got to create a, a executive vice president of marketing and sales. We'll put marketing and sales together and that'll, yeah. that'll, uh, that'll change the culture. They'll, uh, they'll kind of agree with one another, uh, one another now. And of course it makes kind of no difference, uh, kind of what's whatsoever, uh, the, the marketing people within marketing and sales still treat the sales people within marketing and sales the way they, they, uh, they always did. And that's why, that's why there's this block in between, which is the interpersonal domain, uh, because it, it's the mediating uh, domain. So if, if I just use the, this example, if you say a kind of uh, uh, when marketing and sales people kind of uh, talk to one another because the culture is developed that they, that they, uh, uh, that they fight with one another right, in the interpersonal domain, they'll come to those meetings ready to fight They'll come to those meetings uh, kind of uh, uh, saying, uh, I got to watch out for those salespeople or I got to watch out for those, those marketing people. That's, and so you'll have bad interpersonal interactions, which then loop back down to culture to reinforce. Yeah, that's what always happens because those guys are jerks uh, and, and, and they, they, uh, they do it that way. So, but often because those interpersonal uh, kind of uh, things are so, so bad, right? You'll loop that arrow up to formal 
right? To say, well, because they're so bad, we're going to make this formal change. We're going to have a VP of uh, executive vice president of, of, of uh, marketing and sales. But unless the executive vice president of marketing and sales, right, does something that causes the interpersonal interactions to be of a different sort, right? Mm -hmm. That's going to have no impact on, on, on culture. Kind of none on the at culture all. and ultimately on achieving their goals and achieving the goals and that's why it's sort of it's this blocker in the in the middle now it's a blocker but it's also an enabler right so mm -hmm. so if the if the newly appointed executive vice president of marketing and sales uh, uh, in in her let's say in her interactions with salespeople, And they say yes, but marketing doesn't doesn't uh, kind of uh, never listens to us and whatever. If she says, "Oh, okay," well, why don't we why don't we bring the marketing person you're speaking uh, to into this into this uh, meeting? Let's just go find them right now, and let's 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 talk about how marketing and sales on this specific issue, not everything about it, but on this specific issue could come up with a, a, a better result, right? Uh, that is fixing the interpersonal domain in the middle, right? And if, and if, and if, that, if she can uh, uh, have that be a great, great meeting, right? And they come out and tell everybody, you know, uh, you know, that new EVP of marketing and sales um, uh, got us together and we've come up with this great idea. And, and the marketing people, uh, you know, salesperson goes back and says, the marketing people are really excited about it too. And people in the cultural domain will say, ooh, maybe our shared interpretation that marketing never cooperates and agrees is not entirely right maybe mm -hmm. that's not mm -hmm. right let's let's keep our eyes open for this and then the evp has another meeting with 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 uh with two people from each side and they come to a good uh a solution and they go down uh, and tell their people you know what you know she really she's kind of like absolutely kind of committed to to us working together and and it seems it seems to work And then she does it again, and then she does it again, and she does it again. All of those happening in the interpersonal domain, right? And then in due course, the culture will change to, you know, we have tensions because we have different, you know, some are different things we're trying to accomplish. But, you know, generally speaking, we can, we can work those out. And then in due course, she doesn't have to be in any of those, uh, those uh, meetings anymore because the, the culture of marketing and sales is we can figure stuff out. We can mainly figure stuff out. But it wasn't the formal change that made the difference. It was It was if, interpersonal. Yeah. If the formal change spurred a different <clears throat> interpersonal uh, uh, interaction. And when, when that happens, you can change anything. Um, now, one thing that people like when, when they hear me talk about this, they're sort of like, but gee, Roger, that's going to take forever. You're talking about individual meetings. This is a hundred thousand person company. What's going to happen? And what I tell them is, hey, man, Kremlin watching doesn't happen just in Moscow. Uh, it happens in every organization around the world. People watch these things like a hawk to get their cues. And it is remarkable how fast cultures can change. But it's only if there's commitment in the interpersonal domain to change the way people interact with uh, one another. If, if you do that, yeah. so, you can change everything. Yeah. So th thanks for adding this. Now, I would still argue that it probably takes longer then many management consultants like sell it to their clients, right? Oh, so yeah. in your book, you That's bring up the example. Saying, of, <laughs> <laughs> so in your book, you bring up the example of PNG, and you say like AG Laffley had this idea, right? We get rid of the slides because we want to. We don't want the people coming into the executive team and doing a show, and then the executive team just thinking we have to like rip it apart and this bad dynamic. But we want to have a fruitful conversation, which is then the interpersonal part. 
But yeah. overall, it took like four years to get it really established. But immediately you had some kind of change because people had to do things differently, right? Yeah. So I think it's important to, to, to tell people it will take time, but if you're committed, and I would add to that probably in, interested what you think of consistent in terms of how you show up as this example, executive vice president of marketing and sales, yep. if you are committed and consistent, and maybe that those two go in line, then you can see that change really happening in your organization. Absolutely. And, and you know, uh, even though it took some time, three to four years, and maybe four is, is being too conservative that, that, uh, that it was pretty much ensconced within say three years. It's almost 20 years later and you, you couldn't rip out that way of working, you know, kind of with dynamite. Right. So that's yeah. the, that's the good news is that these things are worth making happen because they then have a very, very long tail. Um, and, and so I tend to think, I tend to think they're kind of worth, uh, worth working on, but I mean, you have well, absolutely. to, absolutely, yeah, yeah. But you have, you have to kind of ha have something that you're going to apply your effort to that really is worth it, right? That you, that you can say, if I could make this happen, boy, would it change our competitiveness, right? Which is what AG felt he felt if we could change this process into one that really utilizes the brains because he had a lot of confidence in the brains of his business unit presidents he had a lot of confidence in the brains of the reviewers that you know himself the the cfo the the chief uh, r&d person etc man if we can get those brains working together rather than engaging in useless corporate theater we can be awesome uh, and so for him, the size of the prize was sort of a no-brainer. It was like the, the prize is so big that that uh, it, you'd be crazy not to go after it. Um, and and because, of, because of that, it was worth that effort. But you can't, oh, you know, it's going to be hard to, uh, to do that on 10 things at, at, uh, at the same t uh, time. Yeah. Now another thing that that I was thinking when I when I read this this chapter is when I work with leaders and organizations and as, as part of our classes as well we talk about cultural things I usually bring up two two concepts one is culture you cannot change it directly mm -hmm. so there is this concept from Stephen Covey with the circle of control the circle of influence culture is at maximum in your circle of influence but you always, as a leader, have to think about, okay, what can I do? So what is within my circle of control? And those things you start working on. Now, what I've been teaching is that there are, in general, three things that you can do in that, in that circle of control. One is working on the structures. For example, moving from silos to cross-functional teams. The other is working on the policies, which is, for example, from centralized decision-making to decentralized decision-making. And the third is working on the metrics, which is, for example, instead of just looking at revenue, et cetera, breaking it down into, okay, what is the percentage of revenue? What 3M does very successfully coming from products that we introduced in the past five years, right? That creates different incentives and, and so on and so forth. But all of these things, structures, policies, and metrics, based on what you just explained to me, would fall into the formal box, Right? Now, hopefully, they translate into something happening on the interpersonal level, because if they, if they don't translate into changes on the interpersonal level, what I'm hearing from you is we won't get that cultural change that we want. Is yeah. that correct? Absolutely. And let, let's just, uh, just to illustrate it. 3M, 30% of our uh, of our revenues are going to come from products launched in the la in the recent five years, right? Yeah, five years. Uh, so you say yes, that's that's going to be the ca the case. But then, in reviews, right, of new products, right, in the absolute interpersonal situation, the person is like, oh, Jay, I, I'm not so confident of this. You don't really have enough proof. I don't I don't think so. Right, the culture is going to be 
the, the cultural norm will develop is, you know, you can't get any of this new stuff uh, through. And so let's have tiny little uh, kind of things that are minor innovations so that they get through the gauntlet of this and sure, sure, everybody works on it. And then you add up the metrics and it's 7% of, of, of new products, not 30%. It doesn't matter a whit that you said 30%, right? Like I can say I would like a billion dollars next week and that doesn't matter. Right. Uh, uh, the, uh, and, and so, so the interpersonal uh, domain can block anything. And I mean, mm. absolutely any metric structure process uh, uh, you put in uh, place. Uh, it can help though, right? Like if you have a, if you have a top team that's committed to the 30% at, at, at 3M and says, says to themselves, boy, for that to happen, this is the way I need to conduct myself in R and D or product development, innovation, whatever you're meeting. I have to conduct myself in this way. Well, then, then you're in business. That's because you're putting the interpersonal domain to work on helping those formal formal mechanisms uh, have have effect. Um, but what I don't like about a whole list of formal mechanisms like that is that that is that people can get themselves convinced that that'll do the job. That will yeah. not do um, the do. job, right? And mm -hmm. and the job is done. And that and that's again why, you know, why people sort of like, you know, I hate this kind of distinction. I hate a bunch of these things between hard skills and soft skills, right? Hard skills are your ability to multiply things together and add things up and do R squareds and whatever. And they're really important. It would be nice if you had the soft skills too, but you know, it's really the hard, the hard skills and, and gee, you don't actually have to take, you know, kind of poetry or, uh, English literature, uh, after, you know, grade nine, but you have to take math because, you know, you're useless without math. It's those soft skills of how you conduct yourself in a meeting that are going to determine whether you've got a good company or not full stop. Mm -hmm. Does that mean the hard skills aren't important? No, they're important, but there is no way in the world that in business that I would ever agree to the notion that hard skills are more important than soft skills. That's just mm. false. Now you brought yeah. up. Yes. School, yeah. Right. Yeah. MBAs, you know, at the Rotman school, one of the saddest things was at the Rotman school, uh, the average number of HR o o OBHR courses that the average person took in second year where they're all electives, first year all required. So we make them take whatever we want. Second year, they can choose number of number of uh, OBHR courses taken 0.5 per student. They take 10 in second, second year, 5% uh, uh, application finance strategy, like uh, on, on average, like five of the 10. They just don't get, they all want to be CEO and they don't get how you get to be a CEO. Anyway, that's a rant. That, that's maybe, that's a rant. maybe it needs to become not an elective, but, but a mandatory course. <laughs> yeah. But, but, but you know, it, we, it's mandatory in first, in first year, but the theory is, you know, in second year, you take what interests uh, you, but you, you may yeah. be right. I but, get it. you know, if we did, if we, if now here's the interesting thing, right? So, so we also at the Rodman school had an EMBA. So the, the full-time MBA uh, students, like most full-time MBAs have about four and a half years worth of work experience. EMBA, our EMBA was similar to many other executive MBAs. They had about 14 years of uh, work experience. So they're 10 more years in, in the, in the workforce. The executive MBAs were forever asking for more HR, more HR, more HR in the program. So because they faced the challenges. Yep. The, the, yeah. the full-time MBAs imagined what corporate life would be like, and they imagined that they were going to rise by making presentations with their analyses and everybody saying, oh, you're so smart. Why don't you be CEO? 
uh, and the embers were like, you know, <laughs> unless I can manage my people and motivate my people and figure out what's demotivational and how to change course and change management and, and all of that, I'm never going to make it. So it's just, it's, it's a matter of perspective, I guess. Yeah. So you mentioned Rothman and I want to use this as our, as our final <laughs> piece of this interview today, because you have a fairly big case study around this as part of the chapter around culture. And you start with the organizational structure in place when you left in 2013 wasn't much different from that what you found on arriving in 1998. People were expecting you to make like some business manager, big kind of change, but you didn't. The governance structure was identical. There were tweaks, but that was it. And finally, you didn't make a bold announcement of a new culture. In fact, you didn't talk about culture at all. Instead, you started doing a few things, and three of them you have covered in the book. One is the faculty review, and I promised earlier today that we will come back to how one can offer help. The second is how you managed conflict, and you already gave us some uh, some ideas around that, but I want to make it more clear for everyone here. And the third one was around how you engaged external stakeholders. Let's start with the faculty review. What did you do and what had the biggest impact, especially if you now look at it like with almost 10 years um, since you've left the school? Yeah, yeah. It'll be 10 years soon. Yeah, you're right. Um Okay, so so on faculty reviews, right? Uh, universities are very f you know, f famous for saying in a sort of self-congratulatory way, our faculty is their absolutely key resource. You know, you sink or swim on the quality of your faculty, etc. And I'm an outsider, like I'm a business guy, and I come in and said, oh, okay, I, okay. So I just assumed then that there would be a bunch of processes that would have that would have made sure that we really maximize the value of these faculty members and i would think well the faculty development uh, uh, kind of process probably would be one of those and then and then i figured out what it was which was once a year uh, each faculty member would have to fill out this form which is their annual activity report even an interesting mm -hmm. name, activities like stuff. So uh, they they talk about the research they'd done and the teaching they'd done and whatever. And and the dean me would respond with a what was a form letter with one paragraph that was customized that gave their ranking out of seven on research, teaching, and service. You know, serving on committees and stuff like that is in service and and uh, research and teaching are forty percent of it. Uh, and service is 20%. And so you, you use those weights to give their number. That was it. That was the totality of the, of the development process for your, the, your most important human resource. So I was like, hmm, something doesn't really add up here. So I did what was considered an unbelievably radical thing. I just said, after you submit your, your, uh, your, your annual activity report, because that's mandated by the University of Toronto, I can't change. I, that's a formal mechanism that I cannot uh, change if, if I wanted. You submit that. Then I'll book a one-hour meeting with, uh, with each of you. And the faculty was, oh, okay, fair enough. And then in the meeting, I just asked them a, f a, f a small number of, of quest questions. I asked them, hey, to what extent did you accomplish what you set out to accomplish in this, in this past uh, year? Uh, two, uh, what are you attempting to accomplish uh, in the year going forward? Excellent. And three, is there anything that you need that you don't have that we could help with so that you would accomplish what you uh, uh, seek to uh, accomplish. Um, and that's all, that's all I asked. And they were like a little bit weirded out at first. They thought I was going to give them some instruction, you know, I got to work harder and I need more research from you and whatever. I never, I never, I never did. I just said, you know, I'd, I'd love to hear if you're accomplishing your goals. I'd like to hear what your goals are and I'd like to help out if, if, uh, if, uh, we can. And 
And, uh, you know, that was easy at first because we had 36 and I only did it with full-time tenure stream. We had 30, 36. By the time I left, we had 120. And then all the adjuncts and part-times had heard about it and all loved it. And so I did about 180 of these and they took a good hour of prep time plus an hour with each of them. So it was like six or eight weeks of my, my entire year uh, committed, uh, committed to this. Um, but I think it changed the culture fundamentally uh, because I would help them when they said, I need this kind of help or that kind of help junior faculty member. I just don't have the research budget to travel to this conference. It would be really important for me. Okay. You got it. And they were like, what do you mean you got it? I mean, I said, you know, go to the conference and submit your, your receipts. And they're like, really? Yeah. Um, or, or a more senior faculty member, um, you know, I'm working on this, but I just, I don't know how to get a data set for that. And I would say, well, uh, how about if, you know, if I introduce you to the people at the Royal Bank of Canada uh, and see whether they can, I said, what? You do what? I said, yeah, yeah. Like I know the guy over there uh, and he's a pretty good guy. And I bet he would think this is really cool. But Little, little things. Uh, I, I, I talk about it in the book, the laptop. Or, you know, one, one professor who had to go to the, <laughs> That's where I was going to go to. <laughs> the urban campuses. Like, what would, what would make your life uh, easier? Well, instead of having to download stuff, and this was, you know, 20-ish years ago, download my lectures on floppies and then put them in the machine there and then them not end up being compatible and whatever. I, it would be awesome if I could just take a laptop with it all on, plug it in, uh, in the lecture hall out in Mississauga or in uh, Scarborough and ba-bam, it would, would work easily. And I said, okay. And she's like, Joan, her name, a lovely, lovely woman. Um, uh, she's like, but that's not, that's against policy. And I said, I, I think mainly I like set that uh, uh, policy, right? And she's and, and she said, okay. And I said, just go to IT and tell them you need, you need a laptop. Um, and IT phones me up and says, have we changed the policy? And I said, no, no, we haven't. But there's they an said, exception. Joan, but, Joan, but Joan asked for a computer and I said, yo, yeah, no, she, she definitely needs a laptop. Get her, get her one as soon as, as soon as you, you can. Uh, and I said, if other people can, can, can come to me and make, make the case for why that would be life changing for them, uh, you'll see other people. Um, but no, we haven't sort of said, we're now going to ship laptops to everybody who doesn't need one. Um, so it, it, it just changes, changed. And we had remarkably low turnover in our faculty during my, my time there, like remarkably low. And, and people who are outside the academy don't realize the degree to which people, uh, faculty members don't have a, a massive amount of loyalty. They will just work their way up to better and better schools as, 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 as they can. And so the turnover is, is like people aren't upset. They're just say, well, I got an offer at Stanford, so I'm going to go, right? And, 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 uh, uh, and we had, we just had minimal, minimal turnover. Um, and and it, I think it was all because uh, in the interpersonal domain, we changed the relationship between the dean, uh, administration, and the, uh, and the faculty. To, I'm not, I'm not controlling and judging you. I'm, Seeing if you, I, seeing if in our own, my own little way, I can help you accomplish what you want to. Um, and they, uh, they, they sometimes sort of said, but, but you don't ask that I do stuff that's, that, uh, uh, you know, why don't you ask me for stuff? And I said, well, because I think if you're happy and you're doing really good work and you're really uh, paying attention to your, uh, your teaching, it'll all be fine. It'll all be fine. And, uh, and sure enough. You know, it it, uh, it was. So what I like about this example that you provided, first of all, you highlighted that you couldn't get rid of the annual activity report. It was no. just mandated by the school, right? Again, thinking about circle of control, circle of influence, you probably could have influenced it and over several years at some point got the change. But you're like, why should I bother? It's there. I'll just deal with it. But what you did was looking at what you can control. And there was no rule that you're not allowed to spend one hour per faculty member and get into a conversation. 
So going back to your model, what I found now interesting is a point that this, so there was an interaction between the former dean and faculty members, but it was just written. They submit a review, uh, an annual activity report, and the dean submitted a review, all written. And you changed the form of the interpersonal. Yeah. So you invited them, A, for a face-to-face -face conversation one-on-one. -on -one. That's a change. And then you added something to that, which they were not expecting, which is not you judging them, but you offering your help to so that they can achieve whatever they set out to, to achieve. And being consistent with that, not just doing this with one or two people and only not doing it one year, but over several years resulted. And those were the tiny tweaks that you, that you wrote about earlier in the book. But those were the things that then not only resulted in a cultural change, but if I'm informed correctly, Rotman School of Management from being somewhere in like the B League became one of the really, really, really good schools. And I think... You were nom you were named Dean of the Year at some point? Yeah, in my last year I was named the Global Business School Dean of the Year. First uh, first one outside the US, first time uh, a public uh, institution. But the other thing on faculty is when I got there, like we just weren't even on the map in terms of our rating. And, and um, yeah. the Financial Times came along and started rating business schools, and they had a very rigorous uh, uh, rating for faculty. Uh, um, it was per faculty member, and it was their output in the in the A journals. By the end of my time there, we'd gone from nowhere, and I mean nowhere. We wouldn't have been nowhere. on anybody's <laughs> list of 100 to third. Harvard, Wharton, Rotman. Behind us, Sloan, Stanford, Chicago, Columbia, Berkeley, Fuqua. And no faculty member, even the most optimistic faculty member as of 1998, would have in their wildest dream ever believing that they could get to the top 10 or 15 of that list. Not. Yeah. Not three. top three. Yeah. And, and, you know, they, they did it, not me, right? Um, uh, although I was always one of the top research contributors, thanks to my HBR articles, but they, they, uh, they did it. Uh, I didn't order them to do it. Uh, I didn't make new rules, right? Uh, because that ranking, that ranking, they would, they would ask me. So that ranking uh, really uh, kind of focused on publications in a journals and various professors would come to me and say, well, you know, some of the other schools, right. They, they've got these incentive systems for what, you know, uh, getting in an a journal. And if you don't get into a journals, you get beat up for it and whatever. And you never even talk about it even once. Uh, and I said, well, you know, here's my, here's my view. It's like, it's like, I, I kind of think that if you're all doing good work and you're sending it to the journal, that's appropriate for that work. Uh, there's a hundred of you, or it ended up being 120. There's a hundred uh, of you, you know, just because of the law of large numbers, enough will end up in those A journals. And so you don't worry about that. Just worry about doing great research and publishing in the journals uh, you want to publish it. And they're like, like, are you weird? But, but, you know, it, it, that was to motivate <laughs> them to, motivate them to do stuff that made a difference to them and not worry about somebody else's kind of kind of kind of weird system and i and i just shudder to think of other deans sort of saying we'll pay you five thousand per you know uh you know uh journal major uh, publication mm -hmm. you know, I, I don't i just don't think that's how a people work in general and it sure as hell ain't how professors work Right, they'd be doing something else if they like to do piecework, five thousand per uh, kind of hit. Right, they'd be in another profession. This is a stupid yeah. profession to be Absolutely. in. If, if you like that kind of motiv motivation, uh, you're in it for something else, and you're in it to create knowledge in the domains you want to create knowledge in the way you want to create knowledge in. It's it's, it's entrepreneurship, uh, is 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 what it is. So, so you ha so you have to think about. Right. What signals does everything 
you what what are the signals you send in every interpersonal interaction can you be perfect no did i probably do stupid things i'm sure i, I i'm sure i did but i didn't i i didn't take that task lightly uh, i took the task of conducting myself in every interpersonal interaction in a way that was sort of like what if what if that interaction was taped and put on the evening news right it's would you want that to be indicative of the, the 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 kind of thing that that you'd want everybody else in the in the uh, uh, universe or in the business school uh, to be seeing and thinking about? Absolutely, yeah. And so I want to close this now with um, yeah. the final sentences of this chapter because that summarizes it really well. Oh, good. I'm to glad. That's what culture. it should do. I'm glad it does. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to achieve real culture change, executives should focus on and show discipline in how they structure the human interactions that make up an organization's working day. That requires investing time and committing to repetition. People won't change their ways of... Uh, won't cha- won't, uh, people won't... Uh, change their ways overnight, but when they do, the consequences are profound and durable. And there is this quote, I'm not sure if it's really from Aristotle, but at least it's attributed to them, to him, and it's, you are what you repeatedly do. So when I was reading that final sentence in that chapter, again, going back to culture, being the collective habits of the organization, starting with someone at some point, Ideally, someone like the CEO or the dean in your case, repetition, repetition, repetition. Demonstrate the behaviors that you, if they are taped, would be proud of being shown in the university, and then you can get to that cultural change and based on that, achieve the strategy that you've set out. So, Roger, for me, as always, this was a fantastic, not only conversation, but also learning opportunity. And I hope it was uh, valuable to the people who saw it live and it will be valuable to the people who, who will see the recording. I want to thank you again. Very much appreciate it. You spending your time with me, with us in this case. And um, yeah, big thank you. Hey, it's, it's, it's my pleasure. And can I say, just say one more thing here at the end? Like, I, I think yeah. uh, you are what you repeatedly do is probably a nice motto for the agile kind of scrum movement in many respects, right? It's not very theoretical. It has obviously a theoretical base to it, but it is very sort of practical and pragmatic, at least as 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 I see it from uh, from my my vantage point. And maybe that's one of the reasons it's it has you know taken off the way it, the way it has. It is because it's about doing, and if you repeatedly do this. Uh, it'll get easier and, and you'll be more proficient and, and things will change. So uh, there's a kind of a nice tie between what you do and what I write about at the end of the chapter, I think. Absolutely. 100%. So, Roger, thank you so much. I hope you extend another invitation. <laughs> I do. Let's do, this, let's do this again sometime, my friend. Let's do this again. Perfect. All right. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Bye.